Hi guys, welcome to episode 11 of the Diary of a Dental Coach podcast. Um, we've had some fascinating guests uh, over the last few weeks. I hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, last week we had Elijah Desmond. Uh, he's well known for the dental festival. Um, we had some technical issues last week, so we had to cut that interview short. We've had uh, Rezel Hack, who's a specialist dental accountant. We've had Victoria Jones, who... Um, became um, basically a, a Bitcoin specialist uh, and gave up dentistry to focus on Bitcoin. We've had Karen Nijavan, uh, a, a coach based in Canada uh, who helps uh, dentists and entrepreneurs design their optimal lifestyle by hosting retreats and workshops. We've had so many exciting, exciting guests. So this week we've got, um, we're continuing with the US theme. So this week we've got uh, Dr. Block, and on um, on Wednesday we've got um, Bob Pick as well. Um, you know, people know Bob Pick from Purple Cow Wow. Um, very very exciting. I've done a uh, podcast before with him, so it'll be really really exciting to do that on Wednesday as well. So, uh, without further ado, welcome Dr. Block. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. How are you? I'm doing great. I love what you're up to. Uh, you know, we had a chance to chat a little bit before uh, we went live. And uh, I think there's a lot of synergy in what we're doing and in our experiences. Um, and I, I know all of the, most of those guests that you mentioned, uh, you know, the ones here from the U.S. So you've had a great um, lineup of guests. So um, I'm looking forward to our, our conversation. I think uh, Karen Nijvan talked about the law of attraction. Sometimes you you sort of attract like-minded people, and it's interesting how like-minded people then come together and we end up having conversations. I think it's amazing how life brings us to that. So we're just going to, uh, we, obviously on this podcast, we journey through uh, your life story. Uh, tell me about uh, your childhood. You're, you're based near or around uh, Boston, is that right? Yeah, so I grew up in Andover, Massachusetts, which is about, uh, I would say about four hours from New York City, about th you know 30 minutes north of Boston. And um, I ended up going down to Tulane University, um, which is in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. And I grew up around dentistry. My dad is a retired dentist, but I didn't want to be a dentist. I went to uh, Tulane and was going to be a business major. I was going to study business and economics. And then I sat through statistics classes and microeconomics and macroeconomics. And I said, you know what, this isn't for me. And I ended up having to decide on a major. So I decided on psychology. So I ended up graduating uh, college with a psychology degree. But my senior year, I was out uh, at a bar, which many college students tend to do, and I just missed my mouth. And I hit my, a beer bottle with my number nine <laughs> central incisor, and I cracked my tooth in half. And of course, I felt no pain that night because I was, you know, very drunk. Um, but the next day, I went to a local dentist, and I just really liked the way they took care of me and patched me back up. And you know, I walked in all embarrassed and I left with my smile again. So I thought, you know what, maybe dentistry is something I could do. So I started hanging around my dad's office um, and taking all the... Did your dad encourage it at all? Was it was he uh, kind of come and did he encourage you to go into dentistry or what was his take on it? Yeah, although I told him from the beginning that I didn't want to do dentistry um, but then after my experience with my front tooth, I said, you know what, this is something that maybe I could do. So he encouraged me to come to his office and I watched him work. And then I started taking all the, the classes, the science classes. And so how, how old were you when you started doing this? This was my senior year of college. So I started a little bit late. So, you know, here in the States, you go through four years of undergrad and then four years of dental school. Um, so I didn't decide to do this until my essentially my my senior year of of college. So I had to go back and take all the prerequisite classes uh, over the summer. I actually took a year off uh, after college and I taught tennis and took chemistry and physics. So, so were you a science type of person? Were you always intrigued by health, uh, sort of um, the healthcare area? Yeah, good question. I, 
I thought about maybe becoming a physician, uh, maybe physical therapy. Um, and, you know, when I realized that maybe a, a, being a business major was not for me, I started to think more of the health professions. Uh, but it wasn't until I cracked my front tooth that dentistry really became my, you know, my main focus. So would you say you came from a good background, didn't really struggle? Was it a quite a good financially stable income for you, for your dad? Was he, was he the main provider for you? Correct. Yes, I would agree with all that. Yes. I mean, I'm sure he often must have talked about it. Did he describe it as easy, stressful? Or how, how what was your sort of... Because obviously looking back, it's a different situation, isn't it? When you're a child, you've got your your dad and you're just looking up to him and watching him do his thing and perhaps not really uh perhaps almost like as we all do whatever our parents tell us to do we want to do the opposite because we want to be a mm -hmm. bit of a, a rebel I mean what was your um what was your kind of uh, relationship like um and what was it um how did you really you know obviously you mentioned about this incident with the tooth but I mean before that was there any minor interest or or anything like that you know, I'd, I had been to his office many times, and I don't think I was really passionate about it back then. Uh, sure, I'd see him, you know, with a nice lifestyle, and he, I would see him come home, you know, exhausted sometimes and you know, stressed out uh, a lot of times, but he had a great lifestyle. Um, his practice was more of a uh, high, uh, heavily insurance uh, type of practice. Um, I don't think much fee for service. So it was more of a, like a higher volume type of practice, but he ended up, uh, hiring associates. And I think towards the end of his career, he kind of laid back and, um, let his associates and specialists do more of the work and he did more of the management. Okay. So, uh, obviously you then decided to, to choose, uh, dentistry. What was life like as an undergraduate? Um, did you enjoy, would you say you enjoyed your time um, studying d dentistry? How do you look back Man, on it? I, I would say that every step uh, of my dental journey, there was, you know, major stresses. You know, deciding to go to dental school was not an easy decision. Um, applying to dental school was not easy. Uh, was that an easy lot... decision? You know, when you say that, is that because what you, what other people might think about you doing dentistry or was it yourself? You didn't feel like have the confidence at the time that you could be a dentist what what were the what was the issue with the decision making around choosing dentistry yeah I had to go back and take all of these really difficult science classes uh, in a short period of time and then the pressure of the uh, exam is called the DATs here so it's the dental aptitude test uh, and that's a lot of stress to you have to do well on that on that on that test uh, and you have to have good grades. And um, sure, I didn't know if I would get in or not. So there was uh, a lot of doubt whether I would get in. Uh, luckily, I got into Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale. And um, that's where I went to dental school. But yeah, there was a lot of uh, a lot of, of stress going through that whole process. So, I mean, I would say that's probably for everyone. The hardest bit mm -hmm. is actually getting in and, and getting the, the grades and passing the tests. And obviously, there's similar kind of situation here with um they have the uk cat and different kind of uh tests and uh, tests to, to work out whether um and i think also they now do situational judgment uh tests as well so there's lots of different obviously tests before they decide whether you're suitable or appropriate to to even apply for for dental school um so what was life like as um as a student did you did you enjoy it? Did you struggle with the intensity of the work? What, 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 how would you reflect back on those years? I would say that it was a struggle. I was not one of those people that got, you know, it right away. I had some classmates that, you know, it, it looked like it was so easy for them, you know, whether it was, you know, clinical or non-clinical. Uh, but for me, I had a really, you know, you know, get through and study and work hard and, and nothing really seemed to come easy for me. So uh, it was a struggle. Um, and when I think back, it was, you know, a long four years. But if you think about it, your peer engagement 
is at its highest. I had 100 students in my class. Um, so I had 99 other peers to engage with every day. Uh, people that were going through the same thing that you were going through um, that you could talk to and share stories. So I had a lot of good times, but it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a struggle for me with the tests and exams and, and getting my clinical skills down. Yeah, and I'd, I'd probably agree. I'm quite quite similar in in that sense. I would say that even even in dental school, um, there there are like you said, there's always the the handful of students that you know literally look like they never study and then come top of the class uh, with no studying whatsoever, and you, you even watch them till and they literally can do it. Whereas I was like you, one of those that I had to, you know, I wouldn't get it first time. I'd have to come home read the uh, read the lecture again make notes and really sort of spend a lot of hours trying to understand everything um but i suppose uh, whatever works for everyone and um i suppose you wouldn't be here um talking about your story so it, it was it's was well worth the struggle i had a feeling you know when i back when i look back i think there was a feeling that once you've you've qualified it gets easier but that was quite naive of me to think like that but when you're a young, I suppose, a young person and growing up, nobody's really telling you about what the next stage is. And sometimes you're sort of almost sheltered from that situation. But the mindset was, can't wait to become a dentist because it's just going to get easier. I don't have to do all these exams anymore. And I can just go out and, and earn money. And sadly, that that, is, that isn't the case, is it? No, you're so right. And everything you know, when you're in college or dental school, everything is structured and planned for you. Um, you know, you have the, the classes that you need to take, you have your requirements. Um, it's all kind of laid out for you. And if, if you do well and you, you, you study hard um, and do what you need to do, then you're going to get through it. But after school in the real world, there's no plan that's laid out for you. Um, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, when you get out and you get into the real world, I didn't know how to talk to patients. Uh, in fact, in dental school, we would talk about the patient or um, over the patient as if they weren't even there. Um, and I had no ex uh, experience with running a business or how to deal with staff or marketing or HR. Um, so when you get out, it's a whole new world. It is uh, not like school. Plus, there's a bit of protection as well, isn't there? So if you're struggling with something, there's maybe a tutor or someone will come over and give you a hand with something and help you, uh, you know, get out of that problem. Or you felt like you always had someone, sort of some backup. But then when you're alone in a in a surgery and they're out in the real world and you're the dentist and you're the one making the key decisions about the treatment and doing the treatment as well, it's a different kind of pressure, isn't it? Oh, man, you, you nailed it. Uh, my third week into private practice, uh, I realized I am not in a school environment and I'm in the real world. So I had a patient uh, that did not speak English and he came in and I needed to extract his tooth. So I said, no problem. I'm a super dentist. So I'm going to do this. And uh, in about one minute, his uh, molar cracked and he ended up having a panic attack and he couldn't breathe. And I was like, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. I was so nervous. And this was my third week in a private practice. And I had to call 911 um, and have the, the paramedics take him to the hospital. And I'm like, is this what, you know, every day is going to be like in dentistry? This is my <laughs> third week uh, out of private practice, which was essentially my third day because I worked in this office once a week. Um, so that was a, a quick introduction to uh, you are no longer have a teacher standing over your shoulder. What about, um, this is one thing I not complain about, but I find difficult. I mean, I don't know whether it's the same with your experience, but I felt like there was almost an expectation to, for you to be able to swim when you're out there, even though nobody really considered that you're a newly graduated um dentist even even at that stage and you sort of held to the same accountability as somebody who's doesn't matter how long they've qualified how how so it comes with a lot of responsibility but one thing that I find difficult with with, with dentistry is, is the lack of sometimes supportive colleagues and supportive people around you to help 
you sort of initiate or grad, gradually get into that, um, you know, into the mucky world of dentistry. Did, did you have a, would you say it's a steep learning co- curve? Did you have people who helped you in the early part of your career? I, I had both. I had uh, some practices that I worked in where I had amazing mentors and, and actually the practice that I'm still in today. Uh, I was there as a young associate and now I'm a partner and, um, you know, it really taught me a lot, but I was in other practices that, you know, didn't, didn't help me out. And, um, they were some, you know, not very good experiences. Um, and I, I, any young dentist out there, if you find that, you know, you're not getting the support that you need, um, you're not getting the communication and the mentorship and the help that you need from the owner dentist, um, I would say, you know, have a strong conversation with them and communicate with them. And if it's just not happening, then I would say to move on and find something else. You don't want to be stuck in a bad situation for a long time. Um, and same goes for your patient selection and case selection. Uh, very early on, I thought that I could do everything and on every one. And I didn't want to say no to anyone. I wanted to help everyone and not disappoint them. And I got involved with some cases that were out of my comfort zone. Um, and that can really make for a, a stressful situation. So um, get the support that you need and stay within your comfort zone um, as some advice to young dentists. Brilliant. No, that's definitely sound advice. We actually, I actually had a webinar, um, I think last week on the I Love Dentist with that um, a T for Papa. And he was making the point of making sure that you you, 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 you stay within your comfort zone and rather than taking on cases. And like you said, I think it's that enthusiasm at that age and that sort of feeling of, I suppose you, you want to be as good as everyone else and you don't want everyone to think that you're not as good as everyone else. So you sort of jump right in and think, I'll, I'll be a hero, I can do that. And I was the same, you know, we're, we're all guilty of it. We try and take teeth out that we know we should have referred <laughs> or we know we shouldn't have uh, started. And, you know, like you said, that we, we've all had those moments when, when we hear that crack and we're thinking, oh, great, <laughs> um, sort of thing. And we become wiser and we know and we plan now as, as time goes on, we know what to refer, we know what we can take out, we know what we can't deal with. Um, and you, and, you, and you, you learn through those experiences. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I feel like the thing with dentistry is I think it's a very, um, it's you mm-hmm. and that patient a lot of the time and the, yeah, the decisions you make, you, you ultimately have to justify and there's a lot riding on whatever decisions you choose to do. Um, and obviously all the time we, we always try and we always do act in the best interest of the patient, but we can get it wrong sometimes as well without uh, knowing. Uh, or so, um, so what are your thoughts on, on that? I mean, how do you avoid uh, making the wrong decisions? Yeah, I, I think that comes with experience for sure. Um, and I would say to, you know, to any dentist out there, don't beat yourself up. It's going to happen. You know, you're going to have a bad experience. You're, you're going to get a bad review. You're not going to please everyone and chalk it down as a learning experience, um, and move on. And guess who else has had a bad experience or a negative review or a bad outcome, uh, an open margin or a, a, a difficult, uncomfortable situation with a patient or staff member every other dentist ever in the history of dentistry. So if it happens to you, which it will, don't beat yourself up, you know, learn from it and move on and don't focus on just the bad things that happen during the day. Uh, I used to do this. I would focus on the one bad thing and not the 30 good things. So celebrate the wins and don't uh, sweat, you know, the small stuff and and the one bad thing that happened. Um, And also to back up a little you know, we talked about being a young dentist and associate um, and finding good mentors. But I think also it's very important for uh, any dentists out there that are listening that um, are owners and looking for an associate to treat them well. Um, because, you know, you mentioned dentists come out, they're energetic. They're like sponges. They want to learn. And they maybe they didn't get, you know, the, a great uh, clinical exposure in their dental school So help them out, you know, get them what they need 
as far as supplies and equipment and go slow with them, but treat them well. Um, because you were there once and you don't want to, you want to be treated with respect um, and in a good situation and a good environment. I think this is interesting, isn't it? Because you're shaped by your first few experiences most of the time, including in life. So if you have a negative experience as soon as you've graduated or you come across people uh, who perhaps put you down, perhaps don't uh, have that confidence in you, it can impact your career massively because I feel like dentistry itself is, you know, uh, we sort of touched upon this with, with a previous guest as well is, and, and it, it might sound controversial, but dentistry itself, I feel like dentists themselves, they go through a lot of emotional and psychological trauma every single day practicing dentistry. We're dealing with anxious people. Naturally, that's going to affect the way we feel, because if they're anxious, we feel anxious as well. Um, you know, we're dealing with children who, 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 you know, a lot of the time can, you know, be crying distressed even even obviously adult patients as well so we, we're dealing with with, with 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 their fears and then the second thing obviously we're doing is it's, it's risky it's it's invasive it's not it's not you know it's not not many people enjoy it but they know they have to have it done and we're trying to manage all that as well as perform you know our best dentistry so I feel like there's a lot of uh, sort of the psychological bit that we we feel that that's probably not really talked about a lot. We talk a lot about the clinical aspect of it, but we don't really talk about this psychological impact on on on, on us personally. You know, like you mentioned, a negative experience or something that you feel like it's not gone to plan. How much does that really impact us? I would say significantly it impacts us as well as our personal life. Oh yeah, and you know, if you think about it, it's a very social profession. Um, you have to go from room to room to room and each patient, you have to make them feel special and like they're the only patient in the room uh, or in the, in the office. And you have to connect with them. You have to make them feel comfortable um, because no one wants a sad, tired dentist working on them. So you have to act sometimes and, um, you know, be energetic and, and always pretend like you're in a good mood. So for me, that was exhausting, you know, going um, from room to room, um, you know, I'd be in a, a doing a procedure for a half an hour and, you know, focusing on this one millimeter space and in an awkward position. And then I have to get up and go to the next room and do a hygiene check and then the next room and the hygiene check. And you do this over and over and over again. And it got to the point where it was really wearing me down um, mentally. Um, I got to the point where I dreaded going into work. I couldn't wait until five o'clock so I could go home. I couldn't wait until the weekend so I could decompress. And I said, you know, I can't wait until I retire so I don't have to do this anymore. And it even got to the point where I said, I can't wait until lunch so I can just leave for an hour. Um, so my first Eureka moment was taking action and I picked up the phone and I called a therapist. So how, how old, how many years had you been a dentist when this first happened for you? So I've been a dentist for about 20 years. This was about, I would say, midway through my career. Um, but it was building. It, it, I think it was building from the very beginning of my dental career. And it just kind of bubbled up and finally got to the point where I regretted my, my place in dentistry. I think we've all probably been there at some point. I think any dentist who says they haven't really thought about these things, you know, and, and like you said, for some people, it can just be a, a negative experience and they realize that it's just that stressful patient that eventually sort out or man that problem managed to go away. But, but, but like you said, it's an, it's a continuous basis. And if you don't have your guard up and you don't have that, self-care regime then uh, you, 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 there's only so many punches you can take before you end up falling down yeah it's so true and you know it's so important to and I wish I had done this earlier on in my career um, you know for me it was therapy but you know what you're doing is great it, you know for other people it could be coaches or mentors or peers but to find to well, was there action, a particular incident that basically sort of where you realize this was it, I really need to get help because 
I, I feel like I'm not myself. Um, and and it's this is the thing because we work in like you said millimeters spaces. We can't afford to be operating at less than a ten every single day. Do you know what I mm -hmm. mean? It, it's that fine margin. We can't afford to just you know you, you know what I mean. And I don't mean to be demeaning to other jobs. Like for example, if you're an office worker or you're working in some kind of thing, you know you might just put your head down for them. You can't do that when you've got a patient in front of you. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And even when you're not in the mood, you have to be in the mood. Even when you when you think I'm tired today, I, I, I don't want to be doing that filling today, or I just want it want it to end. And you're thinking. No, they, or they want that root canal, they want that tooth sorting right away, or it's that emergency that's booked in at the end of the day and thinking, I just want to get out of here. I can't, I, I don't want to see this patient, but you still have to bring yourself up and 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 and, and sort that patient out or, or deal with that problem. And and that's the thing that I find that people, you know, you know, when you talk to other people who aren't dentists, they're like, What do you mean? Dent dentistry, it's easy, and you're like, Really? <laughs> Uh, it's very difficult for other people to understand uh, the sort of difficulties or the challenges we face because we, we we really have to be mentally at a 10 as well as physically be ready. And uh, it's a very, very sort of, like you said, a very, um, you know, you have to be very, very dexterous and there's, there's no margin for error, really. Yeah, and that's why I think dentists really get each other because we walked in each other's shoes. We get... The whole dynamic of you know what you went through with school and what you're going through now and and the whole office dynamic um i when i first met with my therapist i would try to explain to her the dynamics of the dental office and i would go through this exhausting 20 minute story and then she'd say so who's the hygienist and who's the assistant again what do they do and i'd be like oh you know, it, it's it's very hard to explain what what goes on, uh, and there's a lot that goes on. And you know, you've heard the the phrase that dentists wear a lot of hats. Well, it's it's so true, um, especially when you own a, a run a practice. I think that's the reason why I set up my own business as a coaching business because I realized that I felt like, especially in in the UK, I felt like the coaches that were out there weren't dentists, and they focused on. I suppose, um, selling and helping dentists sell more private work, helping dentists, uh, because that's what, but they, but they don't really understand the psychology of, of, of a dentist because we don't go into dentistry thinking we want to be millionaires or billionaires, well, or I would say 99% of us don't. We go into dentistry because we, we want to provide, make a difference for our patients. We want to improve the oral health. We want to, it's something we feel passionate about. Yes, we want to obviously earn good money, and that is something part of who doesn't want to earn good money. But when we made the decision to become a dentist, it wasn't financial. It wasn't money motivated. It was genuinely we felt like it was a profession where we could help and care for patients. Nor did we uh, understand, uh, you know, what goes on with having a staff uh, and and all the dynamics there and running a business. Um, so there's so much that we didn't know and, and we had to learn, um, you know, on our own in the real world. Absolutely. And there's a lot of, um, I would call politics as well that happened in, in dental offices, as you like to call them or, or dental clinics, uh, where, um, I feel a bit like there's, there's, there's lots of things to manage and that could be, uh, you know, like you said, it could be the hygienist, it could be the therapist, it could be the receptionist, it could be the practice manager, it, it could be the fellow dentist, it could be there's lots of different things that you as a dentist you're not just it's not just like I suppose it, it well it shouldn't be just like a, a factory worker where you're just seeing the the steady stream of of patients and, and doing your work and sending them on their way it's 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 a lot more than than that yeah and I think it's it's important for a dentist to to understand that it's okay to not know sometimes so as I became an owner of my practice, I think that you know, I, the staff expected me to know certain things and how to be a leader. And I was not a good leader. Um, I still struggle with it. Um, I was not good at, at, at communicating with the team. Um, and there was a lot of questions that I didn't have answers to, but I was expected to. And I think that 
as dentists to tell your team and your staff that, hey, I don't know, but let's look into this. Um, because a lot of this we weren't trained in. You know, sure, we know how to, di- we know how to diagnose and um, treat patients and, and, or refer them out. But when it comes to the non-clinical side, um, there's a lot that we don't know. And um, it's okay you know, to, to seek out for help. Absolutely, absolutely. It definitely is. I feel like that's something we should all change it, our attitude towards, that we should always have a, a learning attitude. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's something that we, we have to learn as well, the, the, the business side of, of dentistry and learning about how, um, you know, how to, to make you improve your dental practice and how to uh, improve the productivity, the efficiency, the obviously the, the turnover, the revenue, all these terms are probably terms that nobody ever talked about <laughs> uh, until you got out and started owning your own practice. Oh, it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. So I was just going to ask about, uh, you know, the, the, the therapy. Um, was this an ongoing thing? Did, did you feel like it helped you? Um, when? Because obviously we're going to get to uh, the stress-free dentistry and the burnout. So could you just give us a bit of a, a run through about what happened with regards to uh, after you, after you realized there's a problem, you got the help. How did you... How did that help you? How did the journey into the stress-free dentistry and burnout um, start? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I graduated with a degree in psychology. So I knew that at some point in my life, I wanted to go through therapy, but I just never did it. Uh, And the first eureka moment for me was when I got to the point where I was so burned out and so stressed and so anxious Uh, I actually thought about leaving dentistry and becoming a lawyer so I could do the suing. That's how afraid I was of getting sued. Um, So it, I had, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, this is no way to live. Um, You can't dread going into work every day. So I finally took the action. I picked up the phone and I called a therapist and it took, you know, I would say a couple of years, maybe a few years of going once every two weeks and really just digging in to why I was the way I was and what I was so anxious about. And then I really had to do some soul searching and make some changes. And um, it took a while, but I got back to the point now where I don't have the Sunday night blues anymore. And I actually enjoy going into work every day. So, so where did the writing a book uh, about stress-free dentistry come from? How did that begin? Was that always in the pipeline? Was that something you always had planned because you had the psychology background or how did the idea of writing your book come about? Yeah. So here's, here's my first book, the stress-free dentist. Um, and no, I was horrible at writing. I was a C plus student in anything with, you know, writing or English. And it was not something I ever thought I would do. Um, and during the, quarantine, um, my office was shut down for about three months and I started to reflect and realize that I had a story to tell. And I wanted to share that story of how I overcame burnout. And I felt like maybe I could help a few dentists out there. Uh, so that's where the inspiration of the, of the book came from. And the first book took me about nine months to write. So I just wanted to ask um, a little bit about, obviously, this book, because I haven't read it myself. Um, it's something I am intrigued about. Um, and for the viewers out there, could you just explain what the symptoms are about burnout and you know, how this book may help you deal with burnout if you are suffering from burnout? Yeah, well, the, you know, first, the title of the book is called The Stress-Free Dentist. And people may think that's a totally oxymoronic term and that those words should not be together. Um, and I think that's true, but it's the realization that it's okay to be stressed. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to have an open margin. These things are going to happen that will make you a lot less stressed. Um, and the book was just really all about my journey and, and, you know, what I did, the changes that I made. Um, a lot of it was, you know, just learning how to take care of myself first before I could take care of others. Um, I think that was a major uh, eureka moment there. And I was saying yes to everyone else 
which was like saying no to myself. And I realized that I'm an introvert and I re-energize and decompress by not talking. I need to just be by myself or be quiet. Uh, whereas other people are extroverts and they feed off of that energy of that socialization. But for me, the social aspect of the profession was wearing me down. Um, and it was the realization that there's nothing wrong with me. This is just how my brain works. This is how I'm wired. Um, and that was sort of my inspiration to, to share that story, to help other dentists realize that they're not the only one going through this, you know, reach out for help. Uh, there's things that you can do, um, to, to, you know, overcome self-doubt and, and fears of failure and, um, that not to give in to the false belief that there's nothing I can do, that this is the profession I chose and I have to ride this out for the next 30 years. That's no way to live. So, think, you know, the, this, this is an interesting point because the thing is that there are 16 different types of personalities and we all may fall into them. I mean, some don't agree with this, but I'm quite a believer that obviously um, we are naturally, there's a personality, but there's also a work mask personality that we have. And there's definitely a lot of the top, this is why I, I think before we went out live on air, I was talking about when I met people outside dentistry, top companies realize this, top companies use psychometric testing, for example, as part of their recruitment process to get the best people in the best positions to work out who who fits the bill for, for whatever. And what um, so I'm quite a big believer, but I think this is something that dentistry sort of misses the the actual makeup of you as a person and who you are uh, and find, finding yourself and then understanding what makes you tick, what things you enjoy, what things will get the best performance out of you. And, and that takes time and it takes somebody skilled, I think, to sort of get you to realize your own strengths and weaknesses and realize why you're thinking the way you're thinking because people people sort of almost it, again it's, it's it's a side we dismiss in dentistry because we focus so much about doing the perfect crown prep doing the perfect veneers but doing the perfect uh, composite restoration we we spend so much time and we applaud all this on instagram and all these social media um outlets but in in reality you know um a lot of the time so you, you know um that's not what dentistry is about um and I, I think dentistry needs to have more of a a psychological component to it for everyone to uh, not suffer from this horrible condition that obviously you describe as as, as burnout because it it really does impact the way you perform, your dentistry, your personal life, your social life, your physical health, your mental health, your relationships with people. Because when you get frustrated, which is what happens, I, you know, would you agree when you, when you suffer from burnout, you get frustration, you get frustration. And how does that manifest? You start taking out on others. That might be your partner, that might be your friends, that might be other things. You might turn to alcohol you might turn to drugs you might turn to other things to numb what's going on it doesn't really fix the problem and that's what that's what my purpose with this podcast is and obviously with the coaching is for people to realize that you know th there are ways to help you get through a career in dentistry it's just sometimes you have to like you said very honestly held your hand up and said look this is how I've, I've felt in the past and I've had to get help but not many dentists are willing to do that because they feel like it it perhaps in their eyes it, it compromises the perception of other people um, and, and and I think that we, we need to and this is why I, why I say other fields are different because they talk about vulnerability for example Brené Brown very openly and business leaders talk about these things because these are all natural things that we all go through but in dentistry we don't have that sort of support mechanism and we don't have those people who think in that way to understand that how how we're feeling and, and trying to sort of explore the emotions the emotional side of dentistry yeah and I would say that you know to get that that psychological support early on you know early on in your career um, 
you know, sure, you want to take classes and, and hone your clinical skills and, you know, learn about the latest ceramics and bonding, but don't forget about taking, you know, courses and coaching on like what you mentioned, find out what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, because dentistry is a grind. It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a long career. Um, and I think the earlier you can get the help uh, that you need, uh, the better off you'll be for the long term. Absolutely. And this is what I, I try and, well, I encourage my clients as well, because coaching is, is about maximizing performance. And if you think about it, if you're mentally having negative feelings, whether that's depression, whether that's anxiety, whether that's frustration, that knock on effect is going to impact your clinical um, your clinical work. It's going to impact your relationships because whilst, you know, we, we can't deny it, whilst you're doing your work, those emotions are running through your head. The, the, you know, whether it's depressed, whether you're angry about something, whether you're stressed about the procedure or something that's just happened before or, or something that's going on in your personal life, you're going to be thinking about it. And the best way to, to clear your head and clear your space is, is, is by tackling these issues head on so that you can then be the best version of yourself. And for me personally, this is what happened when I, like yourself, took a step back and realized that I need to find the real me. The real me wouldn't be sat here on uh, talking to, to to you as it, as in the previous me. But I realized that I needed to do that. I needed to push those boundaries. I remember the first time I, I posted a video on social media and I was looking at it and thinking, oh, my God, I sound so nervous. I sound so scared. I sound so horrible. I wonder what people are thinking. And you're thinking probably one or two people have even watched that video. Nobody's really thinking anything of it. But as as I did it, I gained more confidence, started posting more videos. And, and now I've become even more. And, and I think that's the thing that you have to, I suppose, be brave. And I think courage is, is a key element where you, you be brave and and say, look, I, I want to tackle this issue head on rather than allow it to fester up and manifest in a, in a negative way and then impact, impact everything in a way, impact your whole life. Yeah, you said a couple of things there that <clears throat> I wanted to touch on. One was, yes, a, a burned out dentist is not going to be productive. Uh, I found that a, a sign and symptom was I kept, uh, instead of treating uh, or treatment planning and treating, I would watch and monitor. I would say, you know, let's just keep an eye on that and we'll check it six months. It was because I didn't have the, the energy to, you know, move forward with that treatment or that patient. Um, a happy, dent happy, less stressed dentist is going to be more productive than a, a burned out dentist. Um, and the other thing you mentioned, which I think is, is, is really powerful is that you get better at things that you, um, you know, that as you do them, you just get better and better, like with your coaching and your social media and, and you just get better at it, but you got to take that first step. Um, when I wrote my first book, I was horrible at writing and now I'm getting better and better at it. I'm on my third book, um, the podcast. I was horrible at a podcast and now I'm on my hundredth episode. Um, I've written articles and done speeches and public speaking was one of the most frightening things to me in, at first but now as you do it you just get better and better and you get that confidence um but if you don't get on that stage and try it for the first time then it's never going to happen exactly you have to take that first step and the first step is always the hardest step because it's that fear of the unknown it's that fear of it's that uncertainty and that thinking of what what is everyone going to be thinking um so that will come nicely to obviously stress-free implants which is your second book now, I've heard mixed things about implants. <laughs> uh, some some things, some people love it and they think it's amazing. And absolutely, I've heard others who've who've got into it and found it too stressful, and then decided that it wasn't for them. Uh, so hopefully, this book will sort of clear up some of the uh, misunderstandings about implants. Tell me about how your interest in implants came about. Well, I did a, a two-year residency at Boston University of just implants. And even with all that training, implants for my first half of my career were the, one of the most stressful procedures I did. And it was because I was planning on 2D technology and I was freehanding surgery. And I would just pray that there was enough bone or that my initial preparation was in the right angle or the right position um, and sometimes it wasn't, and the outcome was less than uh, ideal. But now with 3D technology 
and guided surgery, implants have become one of the least stressful procedures I do all day and the most enjoyable procedures. I have a CT scan, I have a 3D printer, and I will virtually plan the case right in front of the patient and I'll 3D print the guide and all the hard work is done before. So now the, the surgery takes about 40 minutes um, and it's pretty much right where I planned it. And also this gives me the ability to see if that case is in my comfort zone. Uh, if it's a case that after I've re reviewed the virtual plan and the CT scan that I don't feel like I wanna do, I'll refer it out. But if it's a case that I feel like I'm comfortable with, then I'll schedule the patient and then I'll 3D print the guide and have them come back in for the guided surgery. Absolutely. Um, I was also going to ask, where did the, uh, obviously your entrepreneurship um, skills begin? Because obviously you have the deal for dentists, which is your side sort of business. Um, and then you, you're a, also a medical and dental director at a company. Tell, tell us a bit more about your entrepreneurial journey and how did that begin? Yeah, so that was my second Eureka moment. And the second Eureka moment was during the quarantine. And my office was closed. And I said to myself, I can't just sit here and eat my kids leftover dino nuggets. So I can't just sit here and feel sorry for myself. And do not so was that an enforced quarantine? Was that from the government that you weren't allowed yeah. to open? Right. Okay. Yep. We had a shutdown for three months and I didn't know how long that was going to be. Uh, it was so unprecedented, but I said to myself, I need to do something and I'm going to make this time productive. And I had an idea for a website, um, which is deals for dentists, which essentially is a marketplace that connects dentists to vendors and it displays vendors new customer offers. Uh, so like new account specials, um, taking essentially taking like the convention or trade show price directly to the dentist's office. Uh, and I was very familiar with this uh, with my journey in implants. I would always ask the rep for a, a, a deal, like can I get 20 implants and get a free surgical kit? And I wanted to do that through all aspects of dentistry and that's where the website came from. Um, and then I said, you know what, I'm having so many great conversations with dentists and companies that this could be a podcast. Uh, and I loved hearing about people's stories. So that's where my podcast came from. Um, and then I so decided what, what's to write the name the, of the podcast, the deals for dentists podcast. Okay. Okay. And we're on our, we just did our hundredth episode. Um, so the next one that comes out will be the hundred and first episode. Um, and then the book, and then I started writing articles and I just kept doing these things that I had no experience with and I was not good at, but I just put a lot of time and energy and focus and I just got better at them. And that's really where the entrepreneurial spirit came from. Brilliant. Brilliant. And this, uh, other role with, uh, all tech industries, uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. All tech industries is all about clean energy and smart cities um, solar power, uh, and then also uh, getting more into uh, medical and dental, which is where I'm trying to grow the company. Um, but it is, you know, very interesting to, you know, for me, very powerful for me to have other interests other than just my dental office. Um, side is that something you that... feel feel passionate about the environment, taking care of the environment? Because in dentistry, there is a lot of wastage, <laughs> and we do uh, produce a lot of clinical wastage as well as you know plastic wastage, as well as lots of different kind of. Um, we're not a very uh, eco friendly uh, profession, I would say. <laughs> is is that something you feel passionate about, or is this something that you just sort of fell into, or how do can you describe this a bit more? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. You know, I, you know, with the, the gas situation and then, you know, the solar abilities that we have and the electric cars. And, um, you know, if you see what we're doing over at All Tech Industries with uh, some companies like Luminescence, which are these beautiful um, solar panels and, and solar trees. And um, I really just kind of fell in love with that whole 
uh, clean energy, smart city. Um, you know, I feel like it's something that I'm, you know, really going to focus my energy on, um, kind of for the second half of my career. Um, and it's just very interesting to get involved with other things than just dentistry. Um, it, I really feel like having these other interests and these other, um, things going on has helped me in dentistry. It's helped me, um, escape and um i can go into my office with a fresh mind and that's not all i'm thinking about all the time anymore uh so i feel like having side hustles is really a great way to to enjoy your main hustle which for me my main hustle is still dentistry but it's helped me enjoy it more absolutely i think a lot of dentists uh, are keen for and a lot of dentists will have side hustles whether that's investments whether that's a uh, personal passion like for me this coaching is my side hustle or is my way of giving back um to the dental field and wanting to help um you know people who have been on similar paths as as you and me because we're not the only ones and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of dentists out there that I just haven't reached out for that help um so um we'll just sort of final sort of um, few minutes of the podcast um, just wanted to ask a little bit more about your uh, personal life because um, I know you've got two children um, I've got three young children how old are your children how do you balance family life with work life yeah I have I have two kids they're seven and nine I have a seven-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter uh, and you know for me it's always a struggle with that work-life balance um, it's Luckily, I live and practice in the same town, so I don't have a big commute. Um, I'm there and, and home, you know, in about seven minutes to the office and back. Um, I've reduced my hours in the office, so I'm, I'm really in the office about three and a half days a week. Um, so I'm there for my kids to coach their soccer team or uh, like today I took them to camp. And um, it's it's I think it's really important. Um, and you know, to not forget about, you know, it's not fair to them if I come home and I'm exhausted and I'm in a bad mood um, because of what happened during the dental office, um, you know, the day of the dental office, um, you know, it, for me to be in a bad mood and not give them my full energy, it, it's not fair to them. So it, it's important. It's not easy uh, with, you know, what we do as dentists to, to come home full of energy and uh, for your kids, it's it it is a struggle, but um, you know when you see their faces when you get home, it, it's all worth it. Exactly, it's 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 mentally quite exhausting, isn't it? I think dentistry it doesn't even have to be stressful, but if you've got back to back treatment procedures all day, or you have a day of just mainly doing treatments all day, it's straining on your eyes, it's straining on your on your back. Sometimes it's straining on your uh, on your on on everything isn't it you, you know it's 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 not easy and by by the end of it you you do just want to go home and relax but then like you said you've got other responsibilities and and like you said you you work for your children don't you you do everything uh to make their life as comfortable as possible and you do everything you can to to help and support them yeah and um just a last bit of advice um a total game changer for me is uh, reducing physical pain. Um, so I stand now for all my treatments. Uh, I've removed my, my chair, my stool from the operatory and I stand. And I'm constantly stretching throughout the day. Um, I used to think that I'd have to wait till the end of the day to stretch or go exercise, but I'm constantly doing yoga throughout the day and, or hanging from a bar. Um, and I use an isolation device to help me retract the tongue and the cheek and the lips. And my back pain and neck pain has gone down to, you know, minimal pain. So, um, I, reducing... I, I really agree. Really help your back and put less strain on it. Mm -hmm. I also, I also have a, a bamboo uh, stool or, or chair. And I think that's really, really helped. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it sort of changed my uh, practicing. But obviously, do, do you use loops as well in magnification? I use loops and uh, the isolation device, and um, it's it's really helped. Absolutely. And what what before we went live and air, we were talking a little bit about football. 
or you call it soccer in, in, in America? What, what kind of interest do you have with regards to sports? Uh, well, I grew up playing tennis, so I'm a big tennis fan. Um, my kids play soccer, so we, um, you know, I coach their soccer team. Um, but, um, you know, here I'm in Boston, so there's uh, Patriots and Red Sox and Bruins and Celtics. So there's, there's a lot of sports going on. Um, but for me, my, my, uh, Zen is playing tennis, uh, and my kids are mostly into soccer these days. Oh, wow. Uh, that, that, that's uh, interesting because it must be on the rise because obviously in, in the UK, it's obviously the, the, the uh, national favorite. And obviously we had this discussion before we went live on air about how, uh, England, uh, the the women's team won the Euros and it's um, you know there's a big party and it was I think the most watched thing on uh, TV as well over 18 million tuned in to watch uh, watch them win the Euros and it was against Germany as well so there was that added kind of spice to it as well so um, yeah well, well done England uh, well done the Lionesses and uh, it's come home that, that's the uh, you know, the, the term we use. Um, so any lasting thoughts to end this podcast for, for dentists, for people watching, any anything that you want to uh, sort of share, any pieces of wisdom for, to? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that what you're doing with your coaching uh, is so important. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I wish I had, you know, done therapy and gotten help earlier, um, you know, whether I was – uh, first year out of school, second year out of school, I don't think it's ever too early to start getting psychological help. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, you, you know, you're only, you only have one mind and one body. Um, and you hope to have a, a long career. Uh, so get the help that you need, take that action and engage with your peers. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just wanted to sort of finish off with, with this. That I think the concept of a coach is misunderstood amongst the dental world. A coach is somebody who encourages, motivates, and uh, basically maximizes the potential in a person. So um, it's about get performance and getting the best out of there. And what dentists, I feel like, need to understand is coaching isn't something that's new. It's very much widely used in sports. It's it's very widely used, for example, you know, even in boxing, tennis, as well as soccer and all these other team sports. It's very widely used. And the reason why... A coach doesn't have to be the best boxer to be the best coach. That That's the thing that people find difficult to understand, that a coach doesn't – you don't have to you – would, we shouldn't see coaches as, as sort of mentors because they're not meant to mentor you. They're meant to – they're meant to maximize your own potential and get the best version of you out. And, and that's something that I want to stress to everyone who's listening, that coaches are facilitators. Coaches are – trying to get the best out of you so the best coaches even in football or even in in other sports aren't necessarily the best in that sport that doesn't you don't have to have the best um you know for a coach to be successful there's other qualities it's that ability to be able to increase that self-awareness of a person maximize their performance get them to understand who they are and work out a way that they can be the best version of them and once you're the best version of you you can then make big strides in whatever you want to achieve. And I think that's the take home message. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, I totally agree because we're all different. And uh, if you can find that coach that can help bring out, you know, the, the strengths and figure out your weaknesses and uh, bring out the best in you, then I think that's uh, super powerful. Absolutely. And obviously you do your uh, podcast deal for dentists. You've also do the, uh, webinars on uh, group uh, I love dentistry group is live with with blocky uh, what, what what's that about by by the way just for the viewers to to know about yeah I I love dentistry and, and live with blocky I just have conversations uh, and that's also what my podcast is about is just finding out people's stories um, how they can help other dentists and uh, giving advice and sharing successes and failures um, that's really what my, you know, my, my goal is. Um, you can also find me on the stress-free dentistry Facebook group, um, and stressfreedentist.com. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with me, uh, if they ever need any help info at the stressfreedentist.com. 
And final question: What what's the future for for uh, Dr. Eric Block? What what have you got planned for the next few years? Well, I'm working on um, actually two more books right now. I'm going to continue to you know do speeches and write articles and webinars and continue with the podcast and um, I, I you know adding new treatments and technologies to my office. I'm very passionate about. Um, this year we started clear aligners next year. I'm going to get more into sleep apnea. Um, so just try to keep reinventing myself and, and, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit is in me and it's a, a switch that I can't turn off and there's always ideas popping into my head. And, um, so it, it'll be more books and, um, you know, more, um, uh, coaching and, and speeches and webinars and Facebook groups. So, um, I'm looking forward to the future. Excellent. Brilliant. Thanks very much uh, for coming on this show. We really, really appreciate it. I've really, really learned a lot about your experience and hopefully there'll be lots of listeners out there who will also learn from this. Oh, thanks so much for having me. All right. Uh, thanks, guys, for listening. On Wednesday, we've got Bob Pick, uh, same time, 8 p.m., uh, Purple Cow Wow Guy. Um, it's definitely an episode you don't want to miss. It is uh, very, very um sort of entertaining as well uh so uh but thanks for watching today and we'll see you on wednesday take care thanks bye